Welcome to this informal press briefing being held at the 21st International AIDS Conference. My name is Sarah Spiker and I'm a communication officer for the World Council of Churches. This press conversation is about challenges and opportunities for collaboration in the faith-based response to HIV. And I'm very pleased to welcome for you here, Ms. Sandra Thurman, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for PEPFAR, Reverend Mike, Michael Schoenemeyer from the United Church of Christ in the United States, uh, Archbishop Tabo Mahova, the Ar Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, and Ms. Sally Smith, the Senior Advisor for Faith-Based Organizations in UNAIDS. The format will be that we will have a, a conversation exchange of questions with the panelists and then I will open it up for any questions that you might have. This is also being live streamed and recorded for, for later viewing. I'm going to direct the first one to Sally with the UNAIDS overview. Um, we are hearing a lot here at the International AIDS Co Conference about the fast track in the HIV response. From the UNAIDS perspective, what does the landscape look like right now for the HIV response, particularly the political landscape. And where do you see the role of faith-based leaders, religious leaders, and faith-based organizations in that response? Thanks very much, Sarah. I think from UNAIDS perspective, if you look at the news every day, you see an increasing rise of conservatism. Uh, and much of that is fueled by religious belief. Uh, and, and we've only got to look at history to know that when you see uh, a conservative religious perspective that is driving exclusion, which is calling the other an outsider, be that because they're of a different color, uh, of a different sexual orientation from a different country, uh, or because they're a young person, then it can lead to tragic consequences. And we need the religious communities more than ever now to turn that tide. And I think also it's a challenge to the media. What are you going to respond to? What are you going to report? Are you going to report the religious leaders who speak out making hate statements and those of bigotry? Or are you going to report on the religious leaders, such as Archbishop here, who speaks out against violence towards homosexual people, against violence towards young people, and in support of, of positive and evidence-informed HIV responses? So as we move forward in the HIV responses, we're going to fast track. We need the faith response more than ever. The faith community provides large proportions of health care in many of the countries, and that health care is integrated into the national health system. If we have support of religious leaders to make sure that that health care is provided in ways that are not stigmatizing, that are based on human rights and evidence, that we can scale up that service delivery at a rapid rate, then we'll be able to meet that treatment gap in a much shorter time. So I think it's the combination of not only the service delivery, but also the voice of religious leaders to address some of those difficult issues of stigma and discrimination in communities that are holding back people from going to take up testing and treatment and from staying on treatment. Your Grace, I mean, I saw you nodding a bit when, when Sally was speaking. Um, do, you, do you recognize, do you see that role of religious leaders in that fast track to the HIV response? Yes, thank you. Maybe let me start by thanking uh, Sally's uh, input. And uh, as a religious leader, uh, uh, also start by uh, confessing and, and, and repenting and uh, I don't have uh, the right to apologize for all the religious leaders and faith leaders who stigmatize and moralize, but we know that um, the God of life um, came so that we may have life and have it abundantly. And uh, the God of life came so that we may all test, see, smell, and embrace justice. Uh, we still have a long way um, uh, to go, and, uh, but our ultimate goal as religious leaders is to make our places of faith safe, our places of faith accessible, and we've come a long way since uh, 1984 we have trained people in urban and rural centers, and we need to intensify that. But there's a degree of those activists and religious leaders that are not those that Sally described as moralizing and judgmental. They are feeling very weary 
and they're feeling very tired because they don't only deal with the sketch and the pain and the hurt of AIDS and HIV. They're having to deal with their fellow religious leaders who don't hold that same position. And so AIDS and HIV has challenged us profoundly as the church to be a church indeed and a church in truth. And so that is my prayer that we could actually fulfill that vocation and mission. Sandra, um, from the PEPFAR perspective, where do you place working with religious leaders in the response to HIV? Well, I think um, in a couple of ways. I mean, the, the first way that we engage with um, both religious institutions and religious leaders is um, in our service delivery as implementing partners on the ground. Um, and they've had incredible uh, uh, impact on the epidemic and the work and del the delivery of health care and delivery of services to orphans and vulnerable children. I mean, the infrastructure that they have to reach communities that are hard to reach is just extraordinary. But for us in, the, um, in Washington, D.C., and the, and the PEPFAR office, uh, the other um, important uh, partnership that we've had with um, religious leaders is an advocacy um, around the need for funding and support uh, for programs in HIV um, and AIDS. And um, we have had unbelievable um, advocates and, and uh, activists among religious leaders um, around the country and around the world uh, that have helped um, with a clarion call to our policymakers uh, to continue their support and expand their support for the work that we do. Um, I think it's going to be really important long term um, uh, for our sustainability uh, to have our religious leaders stay the course and that's something that religious leaders do well. I mean, these religious institutions and the places where we work were there long before we had PEP4 or we had AIDS, and they're going to be there long after our work is done and there, there, there are other challenges. So I think there are a number of ways that we connect, um, and they're just um, invaluable partners in our work. Um, Mike, Sandra just listed a number of positive aspects about religious leadership. I mean, here at the International AIDS Conference, we certainly hear both. And His Grace started with confession and repentance also. From your perspective, where are the, the strong voices of religious leaders most apparent, and where do you want to see them more in terms of the HIV response? Well, um, we see them here at the conference. Uh, many of us are here already engaged in advocacy. We see them uh, in local settings where uh, some religious leaders actually have the courage to stand up. And where do they get that courage? They get that courage because something has happened in their congregation and people in the pews are supporting their leadership. Something has happened at the senior religious leadership level, Your Grace, who's supporting these kinds of things. And so it's not just at one level, it's at all these different le levels that people are finding support and being encouraged. And they're accessing the core values that are true to most every faith. And that is that every person, each one of us, is endowed by our creator with worth and dignity that human judgment cannot set aside. And every faith tradition has that golden rule value that we should treat others the way we want to be treated. And most every faith has something in it that calls the faith community to care for those who are in need, to care for the poor, to care for the sick, and not just to do that as a matter of charity, but to address the systems that oppress people and keep people in poverty and create the vulnerabilities that we see uh, in the HIV epidemic that, uh, that have devastated so many communities and continues to wreak its havoc. We're not where we need to be, and certainly we know that if we're going to get to 2020 and 2030 where we need to be, the faith-based movement has to be fast-tracked. And that's not only the role of the faith-based movement, that's the collaborative role with every other sector in the movement. I was a little bit alarmed last evening when at the plenary, all the sectors were represented at one point in there, but the one that was missing was the faith sector. And faith can no longer be sidelined. We need to be as a part of this whole collaborative. And I appreciate the work 
that PEPFAR and UNAIDS are doing to try to help that happen more and more. But that has to be fast-tracked too. So Mike mentioned this faith-based initiative. Sandra, could you say a little bit more about what you are hoping to explain what the faith-based initiative is with PEPFAR and UNAIDS and what you're hoping it could achieve? Well, thank you. We're really excited about um, this particular faith-based initiative because while we've had um, a really powerful um, partners, implementing partners on the ground, um, we haven't institutionalized partnerships um, at our headquarters level, at the top level. So what we're doing in this initiative is, is not only looking at, at where our partners are at the grassroots level, but we're looking more closely um, and articulating better where our partnerships are at the global level uh, with these institutions. Um, and um, I think we're learning a lot. I think there's, there's something to be said um, for taking these kinds of partnerships and institutionalizing them, not just on the ground, but at the top. So you have a top-down strategy and a bottom-up strategy, and hopefully they meet nicely in the middle. Um, and that's what we're doing with, uh, with this initiative, and actually looking at the experience and data that we have about the, Im the influence and the impact of faith-based institutions so we can better articulate um, that to others um, so that they understand what faith does. You know, if you say faith-based institution, to somebody, everybody interprets it a different way. It's like if you say love to somebody, you know, depending on who you're talking to and what context, um, they interpret it in a different way. So we're hoping to be able to, to really uh, use, uh, collect and use this data uh, to help show people just exactly the kind of impact um, that, that faith-based institutions are having. And I think that speaks to one other thing. And, and on one hand, if you say, you know, what kind of impact are faith-based institutions? Somebody can say, well, they're having a very negative impact. That, you know, we hear a lot of bad stuff about faith-based institutions. So we're perpetuating uh, stigma and discrimination instead of addressing it in some way. So what we want to be able to do is, is help people understand this um, in a clearer way. And I think we're, we're um, well on our way to being able to do that. If we can talk about a very concrete step that religious leaders are showing, and the religious leaders that we have here at the table are showing. One of the first steps in the response is to know your status, uh, that you take a test and you know your status. And I know your grace, and Mike, you've also taken, you've taken an HIV test. How did people react, especially to the archbishop? How did they react when you took an, an HIV test? Yes, yes, thank you for that. You, you know, just now, moving from confession into um, the, what I call the mission field. Um, we, we, we have a very strong uh, uh, interfaith uh, grouping in Southern Africa and, uh, and we meet uh, uh, very regularly. And uh, last, last year, in support to the Minister of Health uh, who shares uh, within South Africa a context called religion and, and health uh, as, as a core patron. We agreed at our interfaith uh, meeting uh, last year to take a uh, public uh, AIDS, AIDS test. And it, it, it was so humorous because uh, in this field, we, sometimes people tend to be too serious. It is wonderful just to break uh, the pain, the heartbreaking with uh, a bit of humor. And um, we all agreed and the minister arrived. He had all his pins and gloves and needle and we, we queued, we went into uh, this little room that, uh, where he was. Uh, he, he, you know, this is probably my third time taking the AIDS test, so I did that and then uh, my colleague was so terrified and when I turned around, uh, he was nowhere to be found. <laughs> um, and we realized that, hey, wait, uh, we assumed that uh, everybody has taken a test. So after taking a test, I went back and, uh, and we had transgressed a critical role that uh, testing needs to be preceded by, by, by counseling. And we thought, as religious leaders, we counsel people, so he, he, he has to understand. So that, uh, that is uh, the, the humor around it. There are some who affirm me uh, as, as a religious leader for taking a test, but, uh, but there are others who criticize me severely to say, uh, Archbishop, you live in Cape Town in Bishop Scott, head of the Anglican Church. If you are tested, 
and uh, if they may, you may be positive, you'll get treatment. But I live in the rural areas of this country where uh, treatment is not e easily available. So if I test and I discover my status, um, what will happen uh, uh, to me? So there are uh, varied responses, but the religious leaders in our country um, are willing to be vulnerable, they're willing to repent, they're willing to, to lead by, by, by examples. And, and that gives me a sense of great joy and hope and uh, that's why we could partner uh, at the highest level as the religious leaders because we are prepared to say the dignity of God's people is an, a non-negotiable and we need to lead by example. Just a final general question to all of you and then I'll open it up to other questions. Now when we have a perspective, you know, we're looking at 35 years in the AIDS response and when we look at the role of, of religion and faith-based organizations, what changes do we see? And can we say anything more about where we would like to go? Mm. Let's start with... Yeah, I'd like to pick up on what His Grace has just said, because I think uh, the, the network of religious leaders openly living with and personally affected by HIV is a huge step uh, of progress. And, and as you said, when religious leaders are tested for HIV, not all of them are negative. Uh, and there are huge consequences for them personally uh, if they are HIV positive. And, and what does that mean for their ministry? What does that mean for their family? Uh, just as anyone else living with HIV, it's a huge impact. Uh, so I think that the, the launching of the African network of religious li leaders living with and personally affected by HIV, followed by an international network, which is also interfaith and has supported religious leaders from many faiths, has been a, a very positive development. And in fact, it was uh, that group, along with the Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance, who led on a call to action from faith and religious leaders in support of the political declaration on AIDS. So you've seen not only a support network for religious leaders living with HIV, but also those leaders leading a faith response in terms of advocacy. And I think that's a very important development. I'll let you have the last word. Maybe you'll put on the mic. So the, the one of the most important roles that the faith community has in is in addressing stigma and discrimination. And we do have some tools for doing that through the framework for dialogue, uh, which follows the measures of stigma from the stigma index. Uh, and one of the important features of the framework for dialogue is the way in which it brings people living with HIV, including religious leaders living with HIV, together with religious leaders and other HIV experts into a dialogue the outcome is hope that there, that will lead to, to specific actions that they will take in their communities to uh, reduce and eliminate stigma. The truth is that we have to ramp up those kinds of activities throughout the world, particularly in impacted areas, if we're going to get to the place where the stigma is low enough so that people feel safe enough, one, to learn about HIV and really know it, two, to get tested, and get into treatment if they're positive, and three, to get involved in doing what they can do, positive or negative or whatever, because the truth is we're all living with HIV, and we all have a role in the response. Well, I'll just add one thing to that. I think that um, I've watched over the course of the last 35 years um, our churches and our other religious institutions um, actually grow um, in the face of HIV and AIDS. And I can remember a quote from a, a colleague um, who said earlier in the epidemic that AIDS does to societies and institutions what it does to the human body. It finds its weakest points and attacks there. And I can remember um, in the 1980s when it was very, very hard to find a church often that would bury someone who had died of AIDS. And over the course of the last three decades, um, we have all um, watched our, our institutions change so much 
um, in the face of this epidemic that forced us in a very real way to look at our own prejudices and biases and look at our texts and our traditions in a very different way. And while there's still some who are lagging behind and who haven't changed much, the majority of faith-based institutions that we have worked with over the last 30 years have changed dramatically in the way they view HIV and AIDS and in the way they view those most at risk for HIV and AIDS. So it's been a wonderful thing to see how a tragedy like HIV and AIDS can bring about change, real change in both individuals and institutions that you wouldn't have thought would have responded necessarily um, with that kind of growth and acceptance. So I think that in some ways, um, as horrible as this epidemic has been, it's been a real gift um, to help us um, strengthen our uh, sort of muscles as faith-based institutions over the course of the last few decades, and I think it will continue to do that. I mean, just to peg on what uh, Sandra said, um, I don't know how many of our Anglican theologians uh, have written and researched on theology and AIDS and HIV, uh, which is something new. Uh, a lot of liturgy um, on AIDS and HIV uh, you know, liberating uh, theological perspectives on a God of justice and the importance of uh, respecting and upholding human dignity. Uh, those are some of the innovative that came out of this uh, tragedy of, of the epidemic. But my longing is for us to increase access to H and H and uh, H, HIV uh, access, particularly to the poorest of the poor to those rural communities because uh, just to take a small sample of our church, it is still very urban based, so we need uh, to reach out. And I really want us to rekindle that and support that prophetic voice that can challenge the indignity of those that suffer, uh, particularly the women and, and children at the hands of uh, very dominant and um, uh, violent men. Uh, and not all men are violent, but uh, there is still a correlation between uh, abusive men and the uh, uh, incidence of AIDS and HIV. Thank you very much. I'd like to open it up now to see if there are any questions that you might have. I would ask that if you have questions, could you come up to use the microphone and introduce yourself? Or there's another one around, around back there. There's one up here in the front. Sammy? Up. Hello. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is it coming through your kit? Okay. My name's Alan Bain. Um, I'm the chair of the Christian HIV AIDS Alliance in, uh, in Britain, and I'm reporting for the Church of England newspaper. I'm also an Anglican priest in the Diocese of Bath and Wells. Hello, Sarah. Um, I want to address a question to you, Archbishop, because uh, being a clergyman myself, I understand completely where you're coming from and, and what happens. I've also been associated with your diocese for nearly 30 years now in particular areas and I've spoken to many of the priests who have gone through this 30 years of work with HIV and AIDS and I've got to say that um, in my opinion many of them are completely and utterly exhausted and in fact they have said that to me more than once that it's the AIDS work that is exhausting them. Uh, they were called to baptise, to preach, to lead churches to uh, bury people, to do all the other things that they do, and now you're asking them to fast track <laughs> when they are already at the point of exhaustion. How are you going to get them to rise to this new challenge? Yeah. Thank you very much for, for that question. Um, it's, it's, a real, it's a real question. Uh, it is very, very painful. It is very... Uh, exhausting, uh, but for me as the Archbishop, um, I, I believe that we have these spiritual resources like spiritual directors and retreats uh, that I try to encourage them to go to so that uh, what we do is not like an NGO 
that concentrates on the evidence-based approach only, but to see this as a spiritual challenge where we, we know that treatment and testing are important, but I'm saying our critical and special role is also to say to people, how do we change uh, behavior? And so AIDS and HIV work then becomes more than access to treatment, also becomes a, a life journey, a pilgrim, because uh, they are on a pilgrim, helping people to live meaningfully in this life. But the point that you are saying is very important. Uh, we, we need to resource them. Uh, I was talking um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago about the need for Sabbath rest uh, for some of them and the importance of having people around where they can go for, for debriefing um, after almost like this low intensity war against those that criticize them for having an understanding of the need to, in, to intervene. Uh, the long and short is I don't have an answer, but uh, the worst will be if we become inactive, and the worst is if we don't heed that Galatian passage uh, to say we should never tire in doing good. So I'm torn in between their reality and the biblical imperative, and I would rather follow the biblical imperative and put certain steps like spiritual direction, like Sabbath rest, rest as something to intervene. But if we don't do it alone, I think we will achieve. Um, the challenge was when PEPFA gave the Anglican Church a lot of resources and we're the principal recipient and we charged one and took all our resources there and, and we nearly wiped ourselves off. But we've realized that it is important to work with CAPSA, to work with the uh, interfaith uh, context so that we don't have to do uh, the work alone. So we've learned. Uh, the long and short, but thank you for raising that question because it is real. Can I, oh, I would just um, add one more thing to that. Thank you, Your Grace. Um, I think that's what, what's been so difficult um, for practitioners, either clergy or practitioners in healthcare, is that when we deal with HIV and AIDS, we're not just dealing with a virus. We're dealing with all the underlying cofactors that exacerbate the spread of the disease, like racism and sexism and homophobia and poverty, all these intrinsic issues that are so difficult to deal with and that no one can deal with alone, but that all of us as practitioners or clergy um, are facing in our own communities. And so find, so it's not just this one thing called AIDS that we have to deal with in an epidemic like this. It's all those very, very difficult um, issues both in society and in our own traditions um, that is so blasted, um, exhausting when we're dealing with them on a, on a daily basis, whether it's violence or whether it's gender issues or whether it's access to education or health care, you know, all those very, very difficult issues that often fall in the lap um, of people in, in faith-based institutions. I think that's, that nearly kills us all um, uh, when, we, when we really sort of work hard at it. The Archbishop just referred to CAPSA. We've been training faith leaders for 15 years in their response to HIV. And that's the point I want to make is the change you spoke about doesn't just happen. Um, there's, there's resources and tools necessary to guide them along this journey. Um, and it often, as you also mentioned, touches so many difficult things. Uh, someone yet, uh, once said we talk of sex and death and that's the two last taboos. Um, and probably also the two things that religious leaders uh, have very little tools for in their, their training. And that's why it's so important that we don't stop equipping and supporting faith leaders in, in, um, in going on this journey. It's not something that just happens by default because you are confronted by pain and by challenges. It needs a process. Okay. I want questions in particular. So there's one more. Thank you. This is a comment to all our esteemed panelists, and I need to be extra careful. My boss is one of them. <laughs> Sandra, you mentioned, amongst all the other good contributions, 
the mainstreaming of the institutionalization at the highest level. In the faith response since 2000, we've done the re theological research. We have the religious, the religious assets, both positive and negative, that have been well researched. There is political will from our leaders. There is the passion of the groundswell of people in faith communities. And I'm talking about across faiths. Fast tracking is the key word at this conference. How do you see, how would you contribute from Pepper's side to ensure that having produced all this evidence, how could this inform a resource response to the faith sector? What more is lacking? We've had retreats for clergy. We had respite weekends for caregivers. We had wilderness experiences for those living with the virus. We can do it. Last night at the conference, only certain key populations were mentioned. And the UN person said, without civil society, we cannot fast track. I want to say to you in a humble voice, without the faith response, we will still face another gap at another conference. We are willing, make it happen. Let that institutional, national, global resource be channeled directly to faith responses. The evidence is there to prove that we can deliver. Thank you. I was just going to say I want to, to just respond and just I, that I couldn't agree with you more. And that is in large part what UNAIDS and PEPFAR are doing now in recognition of the important role to play um, or that, that the faith communities um, and faith-based institutions have always had and will continue to have, not only in this epidemic, but in the next one. And so we are with you. Um, and that's part of what uh, Sally and I are trying to, um, uh, to do with this faith-based initiative. So thank you. I would also like to add that um, while certainly funders like PEPFAR, the Global Fund, and others have a key role in resourcing the response, uh, we as, as members of the faith community also have a responsibility to make sure that our political leaders hear from us and that we are looking closely with the country mechanisms and the other folks to make sure that the resources get where they need to go. And we need to be better organized in our work as faith communities to do that advocacy better and better and better and stand up and make sure that it happens. Um, and, and I believe that we have collaboration partners uh, at all of those levels, but there's going to be some resistance and we're going to have to do it anyway, right? I think I see two questions. That Um, I'm Paul Jeffrey. I'm part of the World Council team here, and I'm also a stringer for Catholic News Service in the United States. And I have a question about the supply side of this question in terms of faith, for example, in the United States, where PEPFAR gets its, its funds. Where are we in terms of dealing with stigma and discrimination in, in, in the political community, in terms of people saying, uh, we don't want to spend money on this stuff. I mean, in the past, we've had problems with prostitution, we've had prosti issues around condom use. Sort of what's the state of that political discussion now? Well, I think that, that um, 
you know, this discussion is ongoing. But I think that over the course of the last decade or so, there's been give and take on both sides um, of these issues. And uh, while they're still um, important, they don't play as central a role as they did in years past. So I think that's good news. I think we're making progress on both sides um, of the equation. I think the other thing is uh, that um, is evolving is for our um, uh, political um, allies to understand that we may not ever agree on everything. And I think this is important to political dialogue and to interfaith dialogue or just faithful dialogue or a marriage. We may never agree on everything, but that doesn't stop us from finding that common ground and really being dedicated and supportive of one another um, in that context and in that work without having to agree on everything. Um, so I think that's, again, been a, a bit of a gift that, that, um, that we have been given and having to struggle and stay together as a community while we, you know, deal with these tensions um, that we have. Um, so the conversations are still there. We still have disagreements. We find ways, um, I think, respectfully, for the most part, um, to address them. And, and, um, and I think that's, that's encouraging. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that because I think there's two or three examples from the last year that really demonstrate some of the changes. Uh, first of all, Pope Francis sent a message to a consultation that was held in Rome recently. Uh, he's also issued both a letter on the pastoral letter on the family and the Laudato Si. He's challenging business leaders to do business differently and look at that moral imperative to provide antiretroviral medications at an affordable price for the poor, for example. And to a message that he sent, he said there is no life that is more valuable than another there, and that we need to make sure that technology is not the, the, the stumbling block, but we use that as a, as a mechanism to drive the, the agenda forward. And he also talked about not using our religious teachings as a rock to, to throw at someone, yeah. but, but being more merciful. So I think we're seeing a change of tone. I think on the, on the UN side, we had the Ebola response last year. And WHO reach out to UNAIDS to ask us to work with the faith communities to look at transforming uh, a dead body management protocol into a, a safe and dignified burial protocol, drawing on some of the work we'd done in AIDS and looking at how the religious communities could modify their practices so that people could bury their dead in a dignified way and stop transmission of the virus at the same time. So there was an opening in one of the UN agencies that, that traditionally has not had strong relationships with the faith community to understand that these pieces are important. And then you now have the Zika virus. And so you then have the intersection of both, where we have the challenges around contraception and the challenges around a virus that is, that is causing harm in, in unborn children. And at the same time, the religious communities in, in that part of the world having restrictions around family planning and, and some of those things. So I think that we see several arenas where this dialogue is moving forward and the intersection of public health and good evidence, as, as the Archbishop said, it's about not only evidence but also theology. But we must be careful not to pit evidence against theology. We must not put rights against religion but actually look for the intersection of human rights and religion, where we have justice and dignity. Uh, so I think what, what we've seen in the last few years is a coming together of many of these issues. What is good public health evidence and practice, and where can the faith community support that? Where is good human rights in collaboration with good theology and, and justice? And, and how can we then see those worked out in practical ways that take the approach forward and, and advance public health? Because Communities of faith are there to mobilize people to take up testing and treatment. And in fast tracking, that's really what we need, to build the bridge between a local community to get people to go to the services. And it's, it's making that connection between what happens at a local and a family level to what's happening in the health service. And that's a place where the religious communities can be particularly useful. Uh, le, le, let me just add briefly and just make uh, uh, just a parochial um, uh, example. Um, I mean, in, in our context, uh, politically, if the country coordinating mechanism uh, together with the South African National Council uh, I mean, have taken a conscious decision that uh, the resources will go to a particular uh, a group, uh, for example, the sex workers and the, um, uh, uh, and the others, 
the sadness about that is the faith group then gets told that, you know, prevention and care and support is no longer a priority. And uh, you now that whole um, a mechanism that we have created in order to uh, 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 complement treatment and testing just fall flat on his face and the, the, faith, the faith sector is unable to, to intervene because now the politics of the country dictates otherwise. So maybe that is why it is important to have this partnership such that when the country coordinated, coordinating mechanism has said no to the faith sector, we continue our primary responsibility of caring for all people, but we are able to still uh, gain resources elsewhere uh, uh, to, uh, to move forward. Otherwise, we are um, uh, held ransom uh, by a political decision, and that is not a hypothetical situation. It is happening currently uh, where we are in South Africa. And I would also offer just this, and that is that um, it's important to realize that what helps to move the political needle around stigma and, and discrimination is also what's happening at the grassroots level and in the pews. And the more we can access the tools that help people create safe space to have the conversations, to develop relationships with pe people who are most affected by this epidemic, that will help us to provide the support for political leadership that's needed in order to continue to reduce the stigma discrimination at the political level, to overcome some of the criminalization that is, that is present in the policies. And that's why we need the local grassroots work and availing ourselves of the tools and the dialogue for this work. Okay, I know there's one more person who's waiting to ask um, a question. Hi, my name is Dina Kutsia. I'm from the University of KwaZulu Natal, and I'm doing my master's on adolescent, uh, adolescents in KwaZulu Natal and their contraceptive use. And I don't speak from any other than just experience. I was raised in a very conservative Christian family when I was younger. And I want to know your thoughts practically on how to engage with adolescents on the realities of sexuality and contraceptive use. Because um, many times people, uh, where I was raised, it was pushed that there's no sex before marriage. There's like LGBTQ, like that's not acceptable. And how do we like change the conversation so that it is a safe and free space within churches to discuss these issues that many adolescents are facing from a much younger age than they, yeah, like from as young as 13 and 14 years old, these questions are being raised. And I feel like in many churches or faith groups, it's, it's kind of shunned to talk about these kind of things. I don't know, that's just from my own experience. And how do you practically feel like uh, engagement with adolescents can can be further improved. Can I turn that over to, to Mike or the, your grace? Well, it's not just about uh, being an adolescent. Um, we are sexual from the time we're born until the time we die. And so coming to understand who we are as sexual beings is a lifelong journey. And uh, sexuality is a gift from God. Uh, that, that we are called to be good stewards of. And that requires us to uh, provide the kind of information that's age appropriate at all the stages of life, together with the values that undergird uh, a healthy and holistic understanding of who we are and how sexuality then is integrated for us as, as whole persons. And there are a growing number of resources that are available for people to utilize and they are, they are uh, resources that can be adapted so that they're culturally competent to a variety of settings. Uh, I come from a tradition in the United Church of Christ when we're a strong proponent of comprehensive sexuality education. And we believe it's really important for people to understand that as a lifelong journey. And so we have resources from the earliest stages of development all the way through to adults. And so that by the time someone is an adolescent and moving in to adulthood, they have uh, information. They have been in settings where they've actually had the opportunity to practice their values with one another and make responsible decisions about that, to be concerned about their own sexual health, and to also uh, uh, have a sense of what it means to be in a community where the values of inclusion and justice are also very, very important. I mean, just, uh, ju just briefly, um, we have uh, introduced um, uh, 
uh, an element within our confirmation classes where confirmation teachers could uh, openly discuss uh, with uh, those that are about to be confirmed. Uh, it's working in certain instances, but it's, it's not working in, in, in the others, where confirmation teachers will say, um, the answer's in the Bible, no sex before marriage, and that uh, closes the debate. But uh, we've, we also have other liturgies, uh, rites of passage, where we, I mean, we're learning. <laughs> we, we haven't been like that, we're learning uh, to be an open society. We haven't always been open. Uh, but the beauty about uh, today's adolescents and uh, young adults is um, the, the Archbishop is no longer uh, this fellow that sits up there and knows everything. Uh, they challenge us, they open our mainframe, and I will say in your own context and maybe through your thesis, maybe come up with something that could challenge uh, your own community, your own church, uh, to open up and make these discussions possible uh, so that South Africa can grow. Thank you. I'd just like to add too, I think the, the, um, the PEPFAR UN AIDS HIV initiative with faith communities is looking at working with some of the faith groups on uh, methods of having intergenerational conversations around faith and using what they call contextual Bible studies. So they take a story from the Bible or from the Quran where there is a, an issue of sexuality that's raised in the story and they bring that then together with uh, a group of older women and, and younger women or older men and younger men and say, okay, what does that say to us today? Uh, for example, the stories of rape. Uh, in the Bible, and so is that happening in your community today? What, what, is, what is the problem? What's happening? How come these things are, are taking place? And it gives that opportunity to start with the religious scriptures, as your grace was saying, not just as a rule book, but actually as a, an, an example, a storybook, and to say how, how are those things happening today? The other thing that the World um, YWCA is doing is training a cadre of young women leaders to advocate on these issues within schools, within uh, within their own religious leadership, within their communities, and in the policy-making space. So I think, again, training young people in how to use their own religious traditions and scriptures and make that case and articulate that case is a very important piece of this work. Thank you. Just one more uh, quick comment. I think that the, one of the other things we need to do is, is provide better training to our uh, theologians and our clergy around human sexuality um, and help them with the data because the data indicate, as I know, I'm sure you know, um, that the more information we give young people about sexuality, the more comprehensive education that we give to them, the more they understand their own sexuality, the less likely they are to have an early debut of sexual activity. So it's counterintuitive though for I think parents and, and other practitioners um, that if the more information we give, the, the less likely our young people are to engage in early sexual activity. Um, so I think we need to do a little, we've got to, we, you know, it's hard to train the grown-ups, but I think we need to do a little better job of training um, our, our um, uh, budding theologians and even our physicians and other practitioners um, and not leave all the responsibility to the young people. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of the panelists very much. We've run a little bit over, so I'm going to have to bring this to a close. Thank you very much for your participation.